we have the honor to uh, to show uh, one flew over the void. Uh, it's a perfect um, contribution to um, our exhibition featuring uh, eighty plus artists uh, from 24 nations on the theme of uh, losing control. Um, briefly, uh, for our audience uh, to introduce uh, you uh, that are joining uh, online and also later can uh, can see us. Um, you were born in Venezuela, uh, where I had the pleasure to spend one year in my early years of 25 years old, uh, losing control there uh, with uh, Mojito mm -hmm. and, and other <laughs> uh, ecstatic, uh, ecstatic and, uh, ec ecstasy enha enhancing uh, um, stuff. Uh, you're now based in uh, New York. I think uh, since we first uh, encountered um, back then uh, in Mexico at uh, my art space when we showed the fishermen, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, great to see how your work uh, developed and how um, successful your career was uh, show, showing your work at Documenta, at the Biennale of Venice, uh, at the Guggenheim, at the Kunst of Zürich and really developing um, an amazing body of uh, work. And uh, we have the pleasure, I think, uh, to get you now on a, on a, on a lecture uh, featuring, I think, three or four works uh, and um, really, really looking forward uh, to it. Um, Javier, um, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for the invitation to talk and, of course, to the invitation to be in your beautiful exhibition. You know, I wish I could see it, but unfortunately, I had to stay in New York. Uh, but I will I see in the images that it's really out of control, you know, <laughs> as it should be. So I'm glad to be in the exhibition and be glad to be in the project. And yes, also happy to be in Vienna and happy to, you know, to have people listening to us. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And yes, uh, I will, how do I start? I will maybe start with the piece that we are uh, showing in Losing Control. Yeah, that would be nice. A small introduction, you know, since uh, 1996, which is already 25 years, I've been working uh, with mental patients, you know, working in collaboration with people with mental illness. Is it good, the, the transmission? Yeah. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, working for the past 25 years with people with mental illness in psychiatric institutions, uh, because uh, the main reason why I choose to work with people with mental illness is because I was born uh, in a very special house. I was born basically in a house out of control, and on a, in a house where control was loose, uh, because my parents were psychiatrists, so they will, actually my father will bring his patients to home to have a consultation, private consultation, but private consultation was not completely private because me and my brothers were also there. So I basically grew up in a daily contact uh, with the mentally ill. So we also uh, did, did often visit the psychiatric hospital where my father worked. So, I mean, what is usually considered kind of unheimlich, you know, mental illness as an unheimlich thing, for us was completely heimlich. I mean, it was like a part of the family, you know, was kind of a daily thing. So I did not grow, grow up with most of the stigmas, uh, stigmatization that people have towards the mental the mental ill. I know that people with mental illness are different, but and this difference should be respected. So in my in in my work, I decided to then create a bridge between people that you know consider themselves normal and those that are like kind of like disenfranchised because they, they are considered pathological. No? Um, so I think it's, the idea is, is to this problem, to actually focus and be specific to this problem, because to this problem, we can see actually how it replicates in other problems of society, you know? How this idea of normativity, you know, or the epistem that is built at, at, around the idea of normativity is actually making, you know, uh, it's actually segregating the people themselves that consider themselves normal, you know? So I would say the role of the psychiatric institution not only define those that are inside, but also define those that are outside. No? I mean, this, this, with this, I, I, I will pass to show a video uh, that documents an action that I made in 2005. It was a commission of uh, Inside, Inside of Five, which is an exhibition that takes place in border between Mexico and United States. So I was asked to make a piece at the border, you know, that was basically the, the commission. So, I mean, my piece was obviously the first time I, I encountered the wall, 
I mean, my first idea was the piece needs to be about collapsing that world. It needs to be about kind of making that world as a not completely disappear because that, be, that would be completely utopic, but you know, also to to collapse it symbolically. No, then I went as I usually do to this uh, closest psychiatric hospital. So I went to Mexicali and and talk to the patients and start you know working with them in collaboration to see how could we actually you know break that wall and you know they would they want to make tunnels and things that were kind of very difficult to to achieve you know in terms of permits and so on so suddenly this idea came to me of having a human cannonball flying you know to the to the wall and then you know basically we buy the the you know the most famous human cannonball of the planet uh, uh, David Smith I love the his name because it's for me always this piece is a social sculpture, so it's nice to have someone named David Smith as the main actor. And uh, I brought him to the hospital, so he met the patients, and then we came up with this idea to make a show together with the human cannonball. Uh, David Smith uh, was an American, and many people had always asked me, why did I choose an American to cross the border between Mexico and the United States? And I always say, because I didn't want to risk the life of uh, another Mexican doing it, you know? Because, I mean, uh, being a human cannibal is a high in risk uh, profession. I mean, 80% of human cannibals in history had accidents. So, I mean, there was always a risk that something would have happened. I mean, Did you lose control? But it, it was all okay. So I, I, will show, I will show a clip. Share screen here. So I won't show the entire video, but it show uh, three minutes so that you can see actually the end of the event. Mm -hmm. Señores, tengo el placer de decirles que ya llegó el hombre bala. El hombre bala, David Smith. Yes. <laughs> 
it's a it's it's, a, it's an amazing piece and uh, our our visitors uh, really loved it and they can still see it until tomorrow here at uh, the house of losing control um you would you like to explore a little bit more the the, the context or continue with the the next uh, yeah. well pieces you know, maybe maybe we can talk a little bit on on each one so i mean yeah, it, it was a very interesting scene because, I mean, I, we don't see now in the clip the entire scene, but, you know, there was a whole uh, uh, spectacle that was organized with the patients. And basically what they did is they, they used the wall as a kind of a, like a metaphor for mm-hmm. their own sort of condition, you know. I mean, not beyond the kind of geopolitical, you know, issues of the of the wall in terms of the Mexico-USA in relation. You know, they wanted to talk about this wall as the wall that actually separated them, you know, from the rest of the Mexicans, you know. I exactly. Mean, the hospital, not actually, you know. So so yeah. for them it was about, you know, being treated as humans. So they choose this subject, and this is something they decide to do. The subject, I mean, I bought the human kind of ball, but then they wanted to do this animal kind of parade, you know, like a circus parade. So without <laughs> animals, they wanted to perform themselves as animals, so they wear masks. And they basically, you know, have signs and they make a whole march in, in Tijuana, you know, mm-hmm. claiming for their rights, you know, like saying that they were also humans and they, you know. So it was a combination of, uh, it was their impetus uh, to really stage this uh, procession and uh, the marching and then like this spectacle uh, that we know from Mexico and other uh, uh, yeah. countries uh, of this carnivalesque uh, and also wearing the mask, how does that come from? Was that there? I mean, the, the carnival is, is, a, is a kind of like a constant element of my work because, you know, it also relates to autobiography. You know, when, when I grew up, I used to go to these carnivals at the psychiatric hospital where my father works, you know. So I will see how, you know, it was really funny. Like they will change, you know, back then the patients have uniforms, so they will trade uniforms of the patients with the white coats of the doctors so i mean at least for a day you could see that you know the house the 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 hospital was completely uh, you know had lost control you know just to go on with the metaphor so for me of course that's the nature of carnival so it's it's a it's 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 a big discussion whether people are you know some people are against carnival and some people are in favor because i mean carnival could actually help to kind of like uh, consolidate you know the structures of power but for me, it's also have a, it's actually the opposite. They have a liberation, you know, force, which I, I, I use it. For instance, even, even obviously, it did, did not help that much to change the hospital because it was only a few days. But, you know, but I, for me, for instance, and for many other people, it helped because it actually introduced a seed of uh, anarchy and, you know, a challenge, you know, to power structures, which I think is very important. I think art for me is that. Art for me is kind of, you have a carnivalist aspect in that sense, you know. Yeah. And also it it, put, it, it helps you to to really enter another state, you know, where which society would not allow otherwise. But uh, behind the mask, within the carnival, you can do st- uh, things, you can get ecstatic that usually uh, our society would condemn, you know. Yes, I mean, the, the mask, of course, the mask is a kind of clear metaphor, but I think, you know, the carnivalists appear in different aspects, you know, which are not only, you know, the most obvious ones, which are the thematic ones, like the circles or the mask. I mean, there's also the idea of like mimicking something else. Like, I mean, for me, for instance, the way, I mean, I often use classic films in my films, you know, and I use them as a kind of like a tools. To kind of uh, to 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 be used by in a sort of bricolage way by by the patients to convey different things. So instead of because I mean the 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 issue I have is that I work in collaboration with people I have never met before. So I meet them, I go to institution and op- make an open call. So I meet them and then we decide to make a film. So I had, since I they never had worked professionally in a film, I had to bring something. It's almost like if you go to a house and you bring flowers or wine. So I bring a film or something that they can actually use. Mm-hmm. And they, with this, using this as a tool, we can actually create a kind of like a collective agency because also these people had not met before in most of the cases. So they meet because of the project. So this creates and, kind of like a, like a structure that so they can collaborate and they can make the piece, you know. We can I mean, in your, your case, growing up with uh, your parents uh, um, and this, uh, in this uh, 
context uh, and with your sensibility, of course, to approach uh, these clinics and uh, uh, the people there. Uh, but is it still was it still when you started out uh, with uh, organizing and and collab these co collaborations because uh, your early work you were all alone no? and this was like you controlled everything. Uh, yes. Now, now how, how complicated was this in the first instance when you uh, searched these kind of collaborations and entered the clinics and really started to collaborate? Uh, um, and also how sensible, uh, you know, not uh, this notion of, okay, you're exploiting, you know, this situation uh, for your artistic uh, aim. Well, the, the first time when, when I started, I started an institution that I knew very well because I had actually helped as a kind of volunteer. Okay. In the, in the art workshops. Uh, so I knew many of the people, so it was very easy to, to work nice. with them. It's kind of a different uh, scene. So after a while, then I started like doing, you know, kind of replicating this model because, it, you know, back in the 90s, you will get 90s and 2000s, you will get invited to biennials and these events, and you, they all wanted to do a piece in each side, you know? So this mm -hmm. kind of size specific uh, interest. Yeah. Or, investment on site specificity was very heavy in the in the 90s and 2000s and so the, like what i use is i reverse it because i mean often cases i saw that artists were just making tourism you know in these places you know they would invite it to tokyo and you will make a piece in tokyo you will invite you know but for me because i have that experience in the psychiatric hospital it was easy to connect with some kind of reality that I knew somehow, even if, of course, it's culturally different, you know, to have a psychiatric institution in Japan or in, or in Vienna, you know, but at the same time, psychiatry is so-called universal, you know, it's potential universal. So the structure of control, let's say, of the patients is similar. So it was yeah. very easy for me to kind of understand, you know, these specific realities and make pieces with them, you know, and, and create a kind of like a short dialogue, you know, between in that encounter, between my encounter with the other, you know, that's what the work is articulated, you know. And uh, working with uh, the mental uh, patients uh, that are basically uh, secluded and separated from the rest of society, and in that sense also there's this kind of uh, uh, power shift, uh, uh, have you ever thought also, or have you perhaps done already, also worked uh, with uh, other uh, people that are sort of excluded. I'm thinking about immigrants, uh, people in poverty, uh, again, yes. as a political statement. Uh, and no, again, yes. uh, that course. art can yeah, change uh, perhaps uh, our view on society. And, uh, yes, because I mean, the thing is that, you know, it seems unrelated. So mental illness, for instance, is not only... You know, it's not only an issue of uh, the normal and the pathological, it's also have things, it's also merged with ideas of, let's say, class, for instance, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, for instance, here in New York, you know, if you have a population of people, I won't use community because I'm not a community, but population of homeless, you know? You will find often how homeless are, I mean... In they are invisible. Are mentally, if you become homeless, you are mentally ill. If you are mentally ill, you become homeless. So it's kind of like a... You know, uh, all in the eye, which is basically, you know, out. If you are not a person to consume or produce, you know, you are immediately, you know, categorized still. I mean, this is book on reading, of course, but you are still, you know, in the, and this has a lot of links with disabilities. So I, I did works also with people that are blind. I did uh, the film called Letter on the Blind for the Use of Those Who See, which is a uh, collaboration with six people that are blind in New York. I also did uh, uh, two pieces. The elephant. Mm -hmm. films Beautiful. With refugees, refugees in, in also in Switzerland as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I one, of the, one of the refugees, for instance, told me he was put in a mental institution because they could not understand what he, it's his language. So basically, you know, the, he was, and he was not, Drug in drugs or the wrong fantasy, just they, they got him in a in a kind of a in a you know kind of a suspicious spot. So they arrest him, and because he couldn't talk, you know, they and he got into a crisis because he brought back memories of his uh, exile, you know, yeah. from but Tibet. It, so so it, that it, is kind of an example of how they, they match. But uh, yes, each each piece is uh, a specific. Maybe maybe I show a, another one. Let me show. Mm -hmm. All right. This film I, I made in in Berlin, for instance, which was made with a, a patients of a clinic. It's called Vivantes Clinic on the east of Berlin. You know, yeah. and the the idea was to restage uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, mm -hmm. which I'm talking about this 
carnivalist use of things. So it was like, for me, it was very important. That film was so important because it's the films, uh, the first film where you see like a psychiatric institution, it's a fiction in in in, uh, in in Germany. So for me, it was a classic that was really interesting to kind of bring back to the situation of today. So basically, we watched the film many times. Okay. So they came out with a script with a small group of eight people. Mm-hmm. So they came out with a script with, with a new story, you know, because I, I also selected a location, which is the Eric Mendelssohn uh, Sonnen Observatorium. Okay, yeah. We, you know, a fantastic expressionist building. So I, I, for me, it was very obvious. I yeah. mean, yeah, Caligari was even made in Potsdam, and this is a building of Potsdam that was made exactly the same year than Caligari. And it's the two kind of iconic, you know, weapons of expressionism and in visual art. So, I mean, to put them together was natural. But for them, it is kind of triggers something else because it triggers okay. science fiction. So they took Caligari, which will be like a more like a horror film, horror noir film. And they brought mm-hmm. it to the context of science fiction. And they made it into a story of an alien and a psychiatrist. Okay. So it's encounter between an alien and a psychiatrist. Of course, the alien became kind of the alter ego of the of the patient, but then also the psychiatrist is not a psychiatrist, it's a patient at the end of the film. So mm-hmm. they, they have that twist that they actually got inspired from another Venus uh, film, that the psychiatrist is also the, the patient, but then- And it's with the sleepwalking, no? Uh... Yeah, with the sleepwalker. But I mean, what, it, what we did here, and we introduced it, and it become a constant in many of my films, it is this idea of, doing the collaboration with the patients where they act. I mean, they are always the actors of the film, but they also, in these cases, they are also spectators of the film. So you see them actually watching the film that you are watching. So this, again, this is another kind of place or Van Gogh game between, you know, who is watching whom, you know, and then it kind of, uh, this is stabilized, you know, the kind of narrative or sta- uh, the stability of the narrative of who is mentally ill or who is normal, you know. Yeah. Because uh, many people say, oh, well, they, they are acting. Uh, actually, most of the times in the, my films, patients are acting as patients. So there's always a little time slippage. They act like, in this case, they act like patients of the 1930s. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's blurring, uh, yeah. appropriated because the context of the race mm-hmm. of the Nazis and so on. So which Caligari kind of perfigurates. But uh, but then, then you cannot say anymore because people usually project. When you see like someone with mental illness, you project this kind of visuality, visual thing, which is kind of like a construction that had to do with physiognomy and, and so on, that people are supposed to look crazy, you know? Mm-hmm. As is, you know, as if you have cancer, you don't look like you have cancer. Or you don't look like, well, maybe you do. I mean, there's a certain stigmatization of cancer too, but it's not as common. You won't see or someone looks diabetic, you know? But people yeah. say someone looks as schizophrenic. So there's that look which we want to destabilize by actually embodying it as a fiction, you know? So there's yeah. this fiction of the... And yeah, to have like a, a cancer, it's not as taboo as to be mentally ill. Ill-, Ill- no, not that like, but, but, it, but it's been, I mean, AIDS was, you know, um, of course... That was, uh, uh, yeah, in the... Illness, illness and his metaphors, you know? I mean, there's this, of course, that there's a... But not nothing as 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 uh, today, you know, nothing as bad as mental. Right. Health, mental Even health. have it now with uh, COVID that uh, mm-hmm. this is separating societies. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So let's, so let's uh, have a look uh, yeah, at uh, the cabinet. The this cabinet, cabinet is uh, yeah, Dr. Called, Caligari. It, yeah, my film is called Caligari and the Sleepwalker. Okay. And uh, in total, it's like a. Well, half an hour, but we'll just show one clip of five minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, to me. Ich bin Dr. Caligari. Ich bin ab jetzt dein Herr und Meister. Du wirst mir zu Willen sein. Folge mir. Thank you. 
Tausend Fragen, tausend Antworten. Und da bekomme ich Angst. Meine Psychose macht sich so bemerkbar, dass ich dann in einem anderen Film bin. Wenn der Normalzustand dann wieder erreicht ist, ist es dann doch ein bisschen einfacher zu leben. Was siehst du in diesem Spiegel? Ich sehe einen Außerirdischen. Wer bist du? Ich bin Cesare. Mein Name ist auch Cesare. Was machst du hier? Ich bin hier, um dir zu helfen. Die Person hinter dir kann uns beiden helfen. Du stehst unter Caligaris Kontrolle. Ich glaube an seine Heilungsmethode. Ich würde gerne aufwachen. Er ist kein Psychiater. Er kann dir nicht helfen. Was ist er dann? Der hört ja auch Stimmen. Das hat wahrscheinlich dann irgendwas mit der Krankheit zu tun. Dass die beiden Personen an Stimmen hören. Und manchmal glauben sie sein ein Außerirdischer. Ich glaube schon, dass die Stimmen, die ich ab und zu höre, gut sein können. Im Moment ist es halt so, dass sie nicht mal negativ sind, sondern dass sie mich eher kommentieren. Jeder Handschlag und jeder Fuß wird halt irgendwie beobachtet wird. Yes, uh, beautiful, uh, Javier. Muchas gracias. Uh, Thank you. In that case, uh, You had to work with uh, with several institutions, not the observatory, the the mental uh, clinic. Uh, how how much time does it take you to produce this uh, amazing work? Uh, uh, well, is, uh, how yeah, many is, years? Uh, I would ask. No, it, it is complicated. It's uh, you know, it's all the years behind, but not <laughs> <laughs> like the you know, there's a story of a sand painter that <laughs> paints something in a second for an emperor, you know, and it took him 20 years to do this thing. And he says, you know, it needs that time to 
No, I mean, it, it is a matter of, I mean, you get used to how to work with institutions in a way, you know, and how to combine them, which is kind of more... Uh, you enjoy the process? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you enjoy it even, even when it's difficult, you know. Uh, this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is part of it. But it's funny, for instance, one of the things with the astrophysics, uh, this the Mendelssohn Tower, I mean, the, the Einstein tomb, is it still used by the astrophysics uh, department of Berlin, you know? And it's a really beautiful story because it was created in the in the thirties. So I mean, no, it was created in nineteen twenty. Yeah, nineteen twenty. So in uh, at it the was time the, film, the original film was uh, produced. Yeah, it, it, the, no, no, the the the, the building, the Eisen Yeah, yeah. The, at the same time of the film, nineteen twenty. Mm -hmm. So when they they created as a homage to Einstein, and actually Einstein came and they said that they didn't, they, he didn't yeah. like make an homage to him, but he only said when they ask him, they say, "Oh, it's too organic or something like that." It's very organic. <laughs> so, but anyway, the, the of course the Nazis, you know, uh, wanted to close it, so they hide the 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 sculpture of Einstein, you know, in the basement. You know, Oh, wow. And they, they, you know, they were able to keep the building, which is great, you know, that they didn't destroy it because it was actually on use. So they use it, they, they still use it. They use it now to test filters, you know. I mean, they don't use it to see the sun anymore because it's not powerful. And Berlin also, you cannot see anything so old now. You but uh, you were the only artist that uh, used the building so far, or do they have a program? Think, yes, for a film, uh, yes. I don't know any other artists that have used it for a film. I know they're photogra photographers, you know, they're very beautiful photographs, you know, yeah. taken by, I, I forgot their names. So the main kind of uh, architect, architectural photographer, very nice pictures of it. But uh, I mean, using the building was not difficult in the sense, I mean, it's a UNESCO protected thing and they trust also. I I was very, you know, we had to make everything without touching the building. We had to light, you know, the building from the outside with like a, a structure ah. folding, you know, like a channel picker, they call it. So to light it because you could not attach anything, or, you know, to yeah. the walls or, or nothing like that. But the only problem I have was, and it had to do actually with Austria, is that I could make a billboard calling the tomb a, a Nangren tomb, as Nangren a kind of, tomb, yeah. a, you know, a kind of a reference to your hospital. So this is the astrophysics didn't like. <laughs> That's the only thing they didn't like that I was named okay, uh, Nangren tomb. The tomb you I know? can imagine, so, but the Nangren tomb in Vienna, I think, would be. Uh, an amazing place for you to explore. Yeah, I would, I would love to do something. <laughs> well, yeah, we have to make that arrangement, uh, really. Um, and it's, um, again, you know, it's very cinematographic, you know, with the black and white, the light and the dark, uh, and, and also the, the selection of the, uh, of the, of, of the actors. Uh, how are, how do you deal with the, uh, that? Uh, also with the same. No, I, I don't I don't do any casting. I mean any you know beyond the beyond what I said before. I make a you know I, what, how is the process to start? Is I select an institution, so I contact the institution. Mm -hmm. I mean uh, contact the people there and to get you know a meeting with the director, the CEO, you know whoever public relations and so I propose my project I show previous projects and usually you know I get like a positive response so I make an open call mostly with our patients even if I had worked before with inpatients but it gets more complicated because it, films can only be done in the institution and so on yeah. uh, and, and people obviously they don't stay you know anymore I mean as when I started my practice people would stay longer time in the hospitals but now they don't stay long enough. So I work with mainly with our patient uh, and a patient population, and I make open calls. So whoever wants to join in, you know, is basically admitted in the film. So in terms of the casting, <laughs> I mean, with Caligari, it was kind of obvious. The oldest person had to be Caligari, you know, because, you know, everyone else was younger. And then Cesare was like uh, uh, Henry. He looks, I mean, would you see him, him without makeup and then, with the makeup. Amazing characters. He was really similar in the in the body body type to society to the uh, sleepwalker of the original film. You know, mm -hmm. 
So apart from that, I don't make a casting. It's, it's themselves. They want to say, I want to play that or I want to play that. and they, Because they also work at the skate, they, they kind of escape their own kind of appearance, you know. And in the in the in the process of developing your project, is the cultural difference, you know, that it's for example the cannibal project in Mexico, okay, vamonos, no lo hacemos, uh, much easier than for example in a context of uh, of Germany where you perhaps the rules and regulations, so I don't know, it's uh, uh no, 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 more complicated all, to get crazy uh, with your uh, it's project. all very specific. I mean as specific as you can say, you know, may I mean, and after leaving in Berlin, you know, because like when I did that piece, I was not living in Berlin. So I, I moved after to do DDAD and I lived there three years. I realized how is, is <laughs> my piece was, you know, Before, okay. but there was something that was told by, by, by my German friends. They said your film was very East because the people were from the East. So, I mean, they were like, I mean, some people like, like Henry was young enough that he didn't have necessarily a tie to the history but hanky hanky did i mean he was like a eastern you know berliner uh-huh. so okay I mean, for him, that's like a kind of like a also the post down oh, wonderful. You know, wonderful. there was all these elements of uh and the caligari also this kind of tension that caligari have that is like a pre 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 nazis you know pre fascism you know so that is, I think, it's in the film. So definitely, <laughs> yeah. specific, no, definitely are specific things. I mean, but obviously, when I brought Caligari, it, it makes it specific. But sometimes what I do is I bring elements that are not specific, but then they become specific in the like the human cannonball. I mean, the human cannonball is not necessarily a Tijuana scene. I mean, as a matter of fact, we have like over three thousand people watching that event because they had never watched. A human cannonball before in their lives, so it was. I, yeah. I, I don't think there was ever a human cannonball. Is, is uh, humor a factor in your work? Uh, because I is see it? also uh, with the fisherman, but also with uh, the cannonball, a, a, a take on very serious matters, but on the on the with a little of a bit of a smile. Also, is this uh, humor? Is, is it, a factor? Yeah, there's humor in some stuff is very dramatic and serious too. You know, but this is sort of. Human, I think, have to do with game with it. So cannibalist, you know. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. I'm, I think I'm, we should uh, also enter the the third, and I think you even have prepared a fourth a fourth piece because uh, time is running. Um, I think uh, Nosferatu, no? Uh, yeah, exactly. The, the undead, uh, the undead is another example of your. Yeah, exactly. Nosferatu and uh, the losing control is a, a subcontext. Yeah. So there is yes, a piece I made in Rochester, and it was filmed in Rochester, and it was filmed in the Kodak factory, and it was filmed in the theater of the Eastman Theater. So it's, so it's a very specific place again, not like the, the place. Uh, it's a film about film, because I mean, Rochester as a city is uh, really tied to the history of, of Kodak, you know, because Kodak changed completely the city, you know, the, when it was founded at the beginning of the 20th century. So, and the loss of Kodak again, no? Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. So it is, it is the film that's in a, in a way more tautologic that I have ever done. It's really a film about film, but of course it's about, also about mental illness as well. So, mm-hmm. so it's again like a half an hour. They're all, they're all short films, but I'm, I'm showing, of course, only, only a, a clip. Pretty clip. What do you see in this one? A 
could see a bat, a uh, butterfly, possibly even a moth, something of that uh, nature. Maybe a creature of the night. see him as a very lonely person. He's when usually people are sleeping and he sleeps usually in the casket. I'm sure he doesn't have a lot of people around. He has a thing for seeking romance with someone or he tries to get out with people but they fear him because he's not of the mortal realm. I myself like dark, creepy areas because I like to do different stuff that's usually out of the ordinary. People usually avoid me. I feel like I get cast aside, kind of like Nosferatu. I think they would love to lock us all away in a closet and forget we exist. They are afraid of the unknown. They think every single person with any mental illness is going to run around with knives and kill people and hurt kids. There are people that are going to be afraid no matter what because they don't either have it or recognize it in themselves. Mental illness wants to stay in the shadows. It wants to be frightening. It wants to be hidden. It wants to grab you when you're not expecting it because that's when it gets the biggest reaction. That's when it hurts the most. The only way to counter that is to bring it into the light. Yeah, amazing film again. Uh, thank you so much. Huh? Um, hmm. So again, uh, your focus on the on on people that are basically invisible, no? Uh, and the outcast uh, in a way of our society. That's, it's a, yeah, that, that runs really through your your work. Well, because I, I think this is, I mean, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned before, my, uh, my living experience with mental illness because of my parents and, and the visit to the hospital, I should also mention that my grandfather had a movie theater. So I go up actually going, you know, on a weekly basis to the movie theater and actually watching the film from the projections in the room. And, and you know, I, I got like a real love for the materiality of film. That's what I most of the times use 16 millimeters or 35 millimeters as a, as, as a medium, even if I show it most of the times in transfer to video because technical. You know. mm -hmm. So uh, for me, film is about that. It's about making visible, you know I mean? For me, the idea of film is making visible actually. So, it's, it's uh, of course a uh, physical scene, but it's also kind of a conceptual scene as well. So, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in that sense, also film, uh, we had uh, before uh, Jules Evans, uh, the philosopher about uh, ecstasy and, and the arts, etc. It's also a way to escape uh, reality or to create your own reality, you know, uh, with film, uh, with art in general. Sure, but it's kind of also a metaphor of the unconscious as well. No, that's how even Sigmund Freud, again to go back to 
even from Sean Eddie who said to mention Floyd. <laughs> yeah. So even Floyd mentioned one of the, you know, of course he talks about the, you know, the magic plant, but I mean, this this idea that film, you know, introduces this idea that film could be kind of like a kind of a, a metaphor of the unconscious. So, so I mean, I, I mean uh, uh, your artistic work, now you mentioned two like very strong um, personal references. No, one was the, the influence of your parents. Uh, as uh, working in the field and then your grandfather in the movie and your interest in the cine cinematography. Uh, have you ever thought about, okay, I want to, in the context of Freud, I want to let loose and uh, escape from that uh, family situation. Like me and my father was in, into sports, for example. I definitely did not want to like, get into sports. No, mm. Was there a certain a time where you said, okay, I have to, completely changed direction? Well, I, uh, yes, but I think I escaped in a way because my, my friends is my, I mean, not to go into, into the, into therapy, but my, my brother is a psychiatrist. <laughs> so okay. I, escaped, I escaped to the idea of being, you know, kind of a uh, responsible of the cure, you know? I okay. Mean, okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, 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 I mean, with the movies there, no, I could not, I, I, I will never escape the cinema, cinephilia, you know, okay. with, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, this uh, French critic call it. Like a cinephile, like cinephile actually being the son of the cinema, you know, the study of cinephile. But it's also it's also a generational thing. I mean, I see my son, for instance, he's 18 now. His relationship to film is completely different. Different, yeah. It's a different center. It's a different, you know, so I, we can help it. We're, we're 20th century, you know, kids. So we're we are cinephiles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we are really uh, only having uh, 10 more minutes, not even. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if you should uh, look at the, at the last uh, or open for some question. Perhaps there's a question or a comment. Uh, uh, should, we, should we take the... Yeah, let's uh, open. I think we're seeing enough. It's more interesting to talk. I think. The Oedipus, you wanted to show the Oedipus. Come, uh, can we, do you still have, you have prepared it? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Yeah. You're talking about uh, Freud, so we have to show Oedipus. Yeah. Okay, it's it's short actually. Oh, the generations of men. All your lives, I find, they come to nothing. Is there a man on earth who sees this more joy than just a dream, a vision? And the vision no sooner dawns than dies blazing into oblivion. My God, I stand revealed at last. Cursed in my birth, cursed in marriage, cursed in the lives I cut down with these hands. And the voices I hear, are they real? You are my great example. You, your life, your destiny. Oedipus, man of misery, I count no man blessed. No longer will you see the pain I've suffered all the pain that I've caused. Too long you've looked upon the ones you never should have seen, blind to the ones you've longed to see, to know. Dreadful what you have done. What superhuman power drove you? God, he ordained my agonies. Quickly cast me away from town. This cursed man, this murderous ruin, the man God hates most of all. Pitiful. You suffer so. You understand so much. I wish you would never know. Don't lecture me, voices. No more advice. If I don't have eyes, I can't find my way into the spirit land. I'll have to wander forever between the winds. How could I look at my father when I die? Or mother so abused? No, not with these eyes. Not this town either. All men must cast me away. Now that I've revealed my guilt, horrendous guilt, oblivion, what a blessing for the mind to dwell in a world away from pain.
Well, no, thank you so much. Uh, okay. Very impressive. Yes, that was, that was Oedipus, you know, made, uh, you know, as a Western in okay. Aspen, Colorado. Yeah. By, by patients with uh, gun junction, Colorado. So they are from, obviously from the West, so they they adapted. You know, again, I'm talking about specifics, I've been something that, it's like a big collage. I think it's Oedipus, you know, X and a, to the context of the West. So they made a reading of it as a, as a Western. And I brought the, the Japanese uh, no theater, you know, uh, mass. Because, uh, yeah. I saw, you know, I, we needed mass because it was a great tragedy. So yeah. the oldest mass, you know, that we have, you know, something, some, somewhere that we can find equivalent of the great tragedy in the no theater. As yeah. a course. Yeah, so it's it's reality. Like, sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so it's it's like a uh, palimpsest of different elements together, you know. Together. Was it with uh, Sackerman she produced it? Which one? Um uh, Miss Sackerberg. Uh, no uh, Zuckerman. Yeah, exactly. Yes. She produced it? Yes, yes. I had the Zuckerman Jacob. Yeah. Yeah, she's 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 a commission, yeah. Yeah, and that was a really nice experience because, uh, you know, I, I went to Aspen, but again, talking about specifics, I mean, I could not find, you know, obviously, I mean, mental patients in Aspen because, you know, <laughs> rich people there. And then they talk about class and, you know, obviously they may be many people with mental illness, but there's, they, there's not a place where you can actually meet them and talk about it, you know. Oh. So I went to Grand Junction, which is a really lower class, you know, city, you know, and then I, I work with this fantastic group of people. And we have this like a we visit this like a ghost town in near Aspen, it's called Ashcroft, and we decide to make the film okay. there. So of course, it's a ghost town. All the characters are ghosts, so there are ghosts of Oedipus and Laius and Jocasta and so on that come to this town and reenact the tragedy again and again. So, so yeah. the kind of like a neurosis of Oedipus become more kind of like Oedipus becomes someone with schizophrenia. So all the chorus is actually voices that he hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's all this different spinach, spin from the original language uh, from the play. And have you ever thought about like a trans? Um, now it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, cinematographic work, but also like would you stage also a theater in that sense, for example, like live performance? Have you uh, uh, in such uh, a situation? Well, I, I I mean I did with the human cannonball, and I saw you know the oh, it's quite actually difficult because. Because, you know, with film, you have the distance to actually, you know, kind the of control. challenge the narrative. Well, but this control is it's also about, yeah. about losing the control of the spectators, the projection, you know, the viewers have of mental illness. Because you can actually, yeah. you know, uh, create certain kinds of alienation effects, you know, to talk about Brecht and also the idea of alienation yeah. to reverse it. Which in in the open, you know, in the in the in the in the actual theater, you know, real in the real, uh, difficult for me, but uh, because it's not, very not, not, not my practice, you know. But uh, so be people will project. It's so like yeah. you know this this idea of exhibiting the mental ill, uh, which is always present in my work too. It's, but not, it's, yeah. it, it's not the same when you are making a film because you are the distance of editing and and different filters that you yeah. don't have when it's a like, event, you know? But, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you never I understand. know. I understand. You a life event again, you know? You, you never know. It's like, I, it's all about having... But, uh, have you, uh, we have to come to the close. Uh, it was really a fantastic journey you took us with. Uh, really, thank you so much uh, for showing uh, the, uh, the cannonball, uh, uh, the, the bala uh, here at our... Uh, exhibition, and uh, I really uh, have to make a, a big effort to to bring you to Vienna. It's uh, it's your city. I can promise you uh, for the work uh, you are doing. And uh, thank you so much. Estamos en contacto. I am. I am. Ready. Yes, I'm ready to be there. <laughs> okay, gracias. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Gracias. Bye. Bye. Bye.